Greetings, BUSN 1360 Software Applications for Business. I'm Dr. McGrory, and my question for you is, are you having fun with PowerPoint? I sure hope so. And as we dive into the Chapter 2 greater, I think you're going to learn even more. And as you've studied your ebook, taken your quiz, worked with the simulation activity, you're learning design concepts in addition to the how-to. And those design concepts are important. They help us look professional, give really good presentations. So we're learning great business skills, great communication skills, and I hope you're having fun. So let's jump in and get started. I'm going to close my PowerPoint that I use as my beginning screen. And as you know, I've already downloaded the files, neatly organized them into a PowerPoint to folder. Look at all this work we've done throughout our term. And I'm going to open this folder because I do want to show you some things as we get started. Last grader video, I mentioned that PowerPoint files can be very large. One of the reasons that they become very large is because of the number of pictures and even the videos that we might put into a PowerPoint presentation. So if you have never used this particular view, you may want to look at it for just a moment. So I've just opened up a folder on my desktop, click on view. We've looked at this in the past, so you know you can look at things as icons, you can look at things as a list. List does not give you the details over here, and so I like to look at details. As I look at these details, look to this far side over here where you see the size. Now this is our PowerPoint presentation that we're going to start with, and 732 kilobytes. Well, you may be wondering, is that big or it's small? It, that's that's small. That That's, you know, nothing really, right? But look down through here until you see violins. Now, remember, I have the file extension displayed on mine, and it shows that it's an MP4, and that means that it's a video. Even if you don't have that displayed, your computer will tell you here the type of file that it is, an MP4. And video files are very large. Whereas our PowerPoint currently has 732 kilobytes, this one has 3,000, over 3,000 kilobytes. We would say that's 3 megabytes. So it's a lot bigger than our PowerPoint file. And we're going to put this video into this PowerPoint. So you're going to see it's going to get bigger. Well, what else do we have here? We have an audio file. So this is an MP3. And that means there's no video. It's audio only. And that's... For, you know, it's a very small clip, and for the small clip that it is, I mean, it's not huge, but it, it's a lot smaller than the video, which is also a very small clip. This is a very small clip of video. So you can see that they start to have some size. Well, combine all this together with a picture that we're going to insert of children, and, you know, you, you may have many more pictures and videos and audios that you're going to insert, and that PowerPoint can become large. Even with what we have, the cautionary note that I'm going to give you is that it can take time to upload, to submit. It can actually take time when you downloaded this. That can take time. It takes some space on your computer as you're working with these files. Sometimes I use a flash drive to store my files. So be aware that these are larger files than in the past. I am going to go ahead and double click my instruction file so that we can look at it. So what is this about? Our project description is that we are doing a PowerPoint for a music school. Isn't that great? A, the Summerfield Music School. And we want to inform our audience. You know, sometimes we persuade, we inform. In this case, we're informing. And we want to tell them about our program, how to enroll, for example. And we want to tell them about, it looks like a yearly music festival each spring. So let's just jump into it. Let's have some fun. This is a four-page set of instructions. They do, they do go quickly, okay, so uh, not to worry. All right, step number one, you know what that step is, which is that we need to open our file. Here it is. It begins with your last name. So here's the Summerfield Music School. Uh, it actually has information in it, unlike uh, our Chapter 1 grader. Looks like it has seven slides, and so we're going to be working through those. So back to the instructions. 
and on to step two. And it says that we're basically focused on reading the readability and the contrast. And so we're going to make some changes to the title placeholder. And then we're going to use the format painter to apply those changes to other placeholders. If you've never used the format painter, you will love it. It's available in Word. It's available in Excel. What it does is it, it sucks up the format settings from whatever you currently have selected, whether that be the font color, the font size, the font style, any of those things, and it paints that onto whatever you select. So it's a really great little tool. So let's just jump in and do that. We are going to slide to, this is where we're going to start. In these instructions, something I really want to point out is that they often very specifically say to you, select the placeholder. And in step two, that is exactly what they say, select the title placeholder. That is different, I want to emphasize this again, it is different than selecting the text. When you select the text, what is selected will be affected, and that is only the text. When you select the object, and we've talked so much about these dots that represent what's selected. That means I'm applying this to the entire container, the text box, and that's what I want. So what they want us to do is to change the font size. Well, we know how to do that to 66. I'm just typing it in there. Enter. They want us to change the font color. Well, that's right here to white text one and they want us to apply italics. So now even additional text that I put into this placeholder will pick up those settings. Now we have applied the formatting we want. We still have this text box container selected. We're going to use the format painter. Now I'll tell you a little trick. If you click it one time, then as soon as you use it one time, it will automatically turn off. And that can be a little problematic because we're going to apply this to the titles of all these other slides. And what's going to happen is as we move from slide to slide, the format painter will automatically turn off and we don't want that. So instead of a single click, we're going to double click. So now when I move my mouse away from the button, can you see the little paintbrush that's next to my mouse, it's stuck onto my mouse and it says you're in this mode. And the Format Painter button is still depressed. So whenever I want to turn it off, I'll just press that button again. I can also press the Escape key on my keyboard. I'm going to click on Slide 3 and I'm going to click on Instruction. And it picked the whole container, which is good. I'm going to go to Slide 4, click Instruments. Slide 5, click Performance Program. Isn't this quick? Because think how many times, okay, I'm going to click Enrollment, but before we had to change the size, we had to change the color, and we had to italicize. So that was three steps. Now we're just doing all of that in one step. So I'm going to go to Slide 7 and click Questions. And that's it for that. So I don't need this anymore. Again, you can click the or you can hit the escape key on your keyboard or you can just click the format painter again. So that's some good work. Let's save that. And let's go back to the instructions. And that was step two and we're on to step three. So I'm going to scroll up a little bit so that we can see. And on step three, it says we have an image that's not relevant, so we're going to delete it. And we're going to shorten the text that we have on our slides. Remember, we don't want really long text on our slides, just some bullet points. And they give us the details down here, but let's just jump in and do it. So remember slide two, that's where I need to be. Select slide two, and I'm going to uh, triple click this first bullet. Remember that selects a paragraph and they want me for this first one to type instruction. So with it selected, I started typing and it, it automatically replaced the text. I don't need to press the delete key, that's just extra steps. So triple click the second bullet. See how it's selected it all? With it all selected, they want me to type instruments. 
And again, I did not delete because that happens automatically when you start to type. And then for the third bullet, I'm going to triple click. And that selects all that. And I'm going to type performance program. Watch your capitalization. Watch your spelling. And it says for the fourth bullet, delete it. So I'm going to triple click. It's selected it all. I'm going to backspace. And then I'm going to backspace again. Now, this is my belief because I, I don't want that extra line there because I believe that the automatic grader may not interpret that correctly. It also is helpful in the sizing of your text. When you have a lot of blank lines in your text container, the text container tries to accommodate all those blank lines. And sometimes the result is that your text is tiny because it just doesn't fit in there right. So it's really good practice to delete those extra lines. And that's what we did, and that was the end of step three. So let's save that, and let's go back to our instructions. With step four, they don't tell us what slide, and so we're still on slide two. And this is now that we've shortened the key points, we can increase the font size and the color for readability and balance. So that's a benefit of having sm smaller amounts of text, is that we can make it bigger, which is easier for our audience to read. So let's do that. Let's go back to our PowerPoint. We're still on slide two. We're going to select all this text. I'm just dragging over it. Now, you may be asking, why not select the, the container, the text box? Because they didn't say so. You certainly could, because we're going to apply these settings to all the text in this container. But in this particular instruction, they said that we're going to select the uh, font, I believe. The way they phrased it led me to believe that. If you want to select the text container, you can post that into the comments and say for step four, you know, it worked out fine or, or it didn't work out fine. Let's try it. So we want to change the font size to 40. Just going to type that. And I pressed enter. And we're going to change the font color to this theme color, which is dark blue accent four. See that? I'm going to pick that. You're going to see that a lot throughout these instructions, and so it's a good idea to kind of make note of that. And believe it or not, that was step four. So let's save that, and let's go back to our instructions. On to step five. It says the illustration on the slide is inconsistent with other images in the presentation, so we're going to delete it. You may be wondering, you know, which slide they tell you down here when they get into the details of the instruction. So we've moved on to slide three. These slide changes, you really got to be paying attention for them. So we're going to get rid of a, an image, and then we're going to format the font a little bit. So let's do that. Back to our PowerPoint. Change to slide three over on the side. And so here below the master violin class, here we have an image. They don't like it. I selected it by clicking it one time. I'm going to press the delete key on my keyboard and it's gone. Now I'm going to, uh, I'm going to change the font color. So I'm going to select this text and they want the font color to be that dark blue accent four. So up here, dark blue accent four. Save that. May click away someplace just so to let it kind of set up and finish its configuration. So I save that. And that, let me double check, that was all of step five. Back to our instructions. On to step six. Now we need to change the alignment of some of our text. And see here how it says two lines of the text in the text box to the left. So uh, two lines of text. So I'm selecting text on this one, so we'll see. Let's go back, and this time on slide seven. Go back to PowerPoint. Moving down to slide seven. So here's the text that they're talking about. If I click in this first line, and if I were to click left, it aligns only that one 
line. So I could either select both lines at the same time or make sure that you click in the second line and also left a line. Now I'm moving fast through that because I think you're familiar with that. This is a skill that you learned in Word. We've even seen it in Excel. So I think you're comfortable with that. Just make sure that that's left aligned. Save that. I believe that was all of step number six. So let's scroll to page two. Woohoo! Now you see here the steps start to get longer and the key for success here, if I was you, I would use a pen or a pencil to mark up these steps. Put a little check mark next to each step after you do it or do them and then go back and verify by checking, you know, putting a check mark next to each one. In that way you'll know that you haven't skipped anything because there's a lot here. So let's jump into it. It says um, we're going to work with the alignment and proximity and repetition to further improve the design. So these are some of the design concepts you were tested on in the quiz and you learned about in your chapter. So first we're going to adjust the size of images so they are consistent and then we're going to set very precisely the horizontal and vertical positions. So let's do that and notice we're on slide four in this one. So let's jump back to our PowerPoint. I'm going to select slide four and they tell us to select all three images and the reason for that is because the formatting that we're going to apply we want to do one time and have it apply to all three images. So I'm going to click the first one. I'm going to hold my control key down and click the next one keep the control key held down and cl click the last one. Now with all three selected, lifting my hands up, I don't have any keys held down. Now look at the dots. That tells you what's selected. So we know we have all three selected. So with all three selected, they say they want to um, format these and deselect the lock aspect ratio. Well, my format picture panel happens to be open, but if it's not, I'm going to close it because yours may not be open. So up on here in the picture format ribbon, look over to the right hand side. This is where we typically affect the height and width. And when we lock the aspect, it means that if we change one of these, we change the height that we want the picture to remain proportional. And by default, it will do that for a picture. For, for a photograph, okay, picture. They want us to deselect that. Well, that's kind of a property of this height and width. So if we click this launcher button, see that launcher? That will open the panel. Another thing that you can do is you could right click any one of these pictures that's selected. So with this, when I open that launcher, it had already selected this icon and it's called the size and properties icon. It's just kind of a little box with some arrows inside of it. And the first thing that they want us to do is deselect that lock aspect ratio. So see it down here? I'm going to click that to uncheck it. That means that when I change the height, the width is not going to automatically change to keep it proportional and vice versa because we've unlocked it. So that's what they want us to do. And they want us to set the height to 2.7. Now I can do this here if you're wondering. I could also do it up where we have changed the height of things before. Th this is the same. 2.7 and I'm going to press the enter key and you should have seen these kind of change just a little bit and for the width they want me to set the width to 3.75 so 3.75 enter and you see them all change just a little bit and so it applied to all three of them at the same time. Now we're still keeping all three selected and they want us to change the vertical position so up and down so that they're all very precisely at the same vertical position, the same measure from let's say the top of the page. So they're all three selected in this same format picture and under this same size and position icon, look down the page and you may need to expand this position category. Just click that little arrow 
See how it expands and collapses? And it says that it's going to measure from the top left corner. Okay, we have an option. If we prefer, we can measure from the center. But we're going to keep it, oops, sorry, we're going to keep it top left corner. And they say they want the vertical position, so that's this one down here, set to 2.4. Enter. Now see what it did? It positioned them so that they are all vertically positioned 2.4 inches from the top left corner of the screen. In other words, from the top down. Okay. Now they want us to set the horizontal position, but we don't want them all to be horizontally positioned in the same because they'd be stacked on top of each other, right, instead of spread across the paper. So I'm just going to click one time on this image. Now, do you notice when I click on it, they all three are staying selected? I can see the dots, and I want only one to be affected. So I don't want that. I'm going to click away somewhere safe, like, for example, out here in the margin of the page. And when I click there, effectively I select something that's kind of not there, and it deselects. The result is that nothing is selected now. Now I can click one time on that image. I see the dots go around the image, and I know that that's the only thing that is selected, and that's what I want. Now when I look over at my format picture panel, it changed icons on me. I'm in this effects icon. I don't want that. I need to click over here again in the size and properties. Because we adjusted the size, we're working on the position, we know the vertical position because we already set that, but they want the horizontal position for this woods and brass image to be 1.3. So I'm just selecting that and I'm going to type 1.3 and I'm going to press the Enter key. Did you see it move just a little bit? Now I'm going to click the next image. It wasn't selected, so I can see that now it is selected and I see the dots going around it. Well, I'm on the correct icon in my format picture panel. I know my height and my width are, were previously set. The vertical position was previously set. And now I'm on to horizontal position. And they want this one to be 5.3. So 5.3, Enter. And I saw it move over just a little bit. That's fine. Now I'm going to select this last image by clicking on it. And so this is the percussion image, and they want this positioned horizontally at 9.3. Enter. So there were a lot of pieces and parts in there. I'm just trying to give it a quick double check. I think I've got everything. If I miss something, the grader is going to catch me on it, the automatic grader. I will post a note, and we know that we always have the opportunity to fix our mistakes afterwards. It's how we all learn. And sometimes, you know, it's just human error, just little simple mistakes, and that's why it's important to fix them. So you get all those points. Let's save that, and let's go back to our instructions. That was step seven. So now we're on to step eight, and I see a lot of details in here very important. You may want to use a check mark, right? So now it says we need to move and align the text boxes to their corresponding images. So you may have recognized that on slide four, and we're still working on slide four, that our text boxes were kind of left out of whack. And so now we're going to fix those up. It says this uses the principle of proximity, grouping related items together to create a relationship. Okay, so let's go ahead and go back to our PowerPoint and let's do these steps. So first, way down here, and it's gotten separated from its picture, we want the text box. So I want to make sure that I'm moving my mouse over the edge, not a handle. These are sizing handles. I want it over the border, so someplace in the middle, and see how my mouse is looks a little different. I'm going to click so that I have the entire container selected. And with it selected, over here in my Format Shape panel, and that should still be open, I'm going to go down here to Position. And in the Position area, I'm going to change the Horizontal Position to 
point seven. And you may notice I'm just selecting the text in there and then I start typing. When I finish typing, I press enter. 1.7. That's what they wanted, okay? And then for the vertical, what do they want for the vertical? For the vertical, they want 5.2. Enter. Now it looks much better, closer to that image. So next we're going to select the strings text box. Again, I've clicked and I see my insertion point flashing in there. I don't necessarily want that, so I want to make sure to be proper that I click on the border so that the container is selected. Sometimes you get different menu options, and so I'm kind of just driving this home as, as good practice, good principle. I have this container selected. They want it to be 5.5. .5. That time I backspaced, so 5.5, .5, enter. And then for the vertical, let me select it. For the vertical, 5.2, enter. And I look at it, it's looking nice. Finally, the percussion. See how I selected the container? And they want the horizontal to be 9.9, .9, enter and they want the vertical to be 5.2, enter. Wow, that's looking good, and that's a lot of detail in that step. Very easy to make a mistake because you missed some of the detail. But as you complete it and you look at it, it should make sense. So kind of give it that spot check. Everything look okay? Is it making sense? Looks good. Let's save it. Let's go back to our instructions. That was step eight. On to step nine. To add consistency, you apply the same picture style to all three images. And that is important. We want things to look consistent. So let's go back. It's on slide four. Let's go back to PowerPoint. We're still working on slide four. And we're going to format all three images at the same time. So I'm going to pick the first one. I'm going to hold my control key down and click each of the others. The sizing handles, the dots, are on each one of those images. So I know all three are selected. And towards the top, I have my picture format tab. And on this ribbon for that picture format tab, these are my picture styles and they want drop shadow rectangle. I think it's this one, fourth across, drop shadow rectangle. When you hover over it, it shows you what that's going to look like. So now I'm gonna click on it. And now that's been applied. And that was step nine, so let's save that. And let's go back to the instructions. Goodness, you are doing great. <laughs> Flying through these steps, got it. Step 10, to illustrate the enrollment process, you use a series of shapes, okay? So a little different than images, right, or pictures that you've taken with your cell phone or, you know, some maybe a real professional digital camera. Now we're using some shapes and we're working on slide six. So let's do that and we're going to put in a hexagon with some very specific dimensions. So let's do that. Let's go to PowerPoint and let's go to slide six and on slide six what they want us to do is insert a hexagon and they're kind of vague initially they just say put it over there on the left portion okay well a hexagon is like a stop sign it's one of those six-sided images so insert and they said it's a shape see the shapes here click on that drop down now let's see, it's going to be one of our basic shapes. If you've used it before, you might find it up here in the recently used, but otherwise it's going to be in the basic shapes. And as I go across, if you can kind of see it right there, hexagon. And I'm just going to somewhat randomly, and you see my mouse has changed, that means I'm not going to select. When I'm selecting, I have that pointer. This is I'm drawing. Well, I can just 
press and drag, and I drag diagonally. And is that good? Who knows? Good enough because we're going to then put in the specific configurations. So now that I have it and it is selected, my format shape panel is already open. I want to change to this icon, which is the size and positions. And they want me to set the height to 1.94. Enter. And the width to 2.35. Enter and they want me to set the position. So the horizontal position is going to be 0.99, enter. And the vertical position is going to be 2.53, enter. So they've now got it sized exactly how they want it and positioned exactly how they want it. So save that. Let's go back to the instructions, and we're on to step 11. And I'm going to scroll up so that we can see the rest of the steps. Now, it doesn't specify the slide, but we are still on slide number 6. And what they want us to do is to insert three more of those hexagon shapes. And they're telling us kind of a little... Um, shortcut way to do that. So as you look at this, notice it says um, to lock the drawing mode. In other words, instead of as soon as we put in that hexagon, our pointer selector mouse came back. Instead of the crosshair, which is kind of that little thin plus sign, that's like a, a crosshair for drawing, uh, it went back to the selecting pointer mouse. This time we're going to stay in that drawing crosshair. We're going to make three of those and then they're telling us how we're going to set the height and width for those. Special note for Mac users, it says create the shape once and then use command D to duplicate it. PC users, we could do that as well if you're a Windows user. For us, it's control D. You make one shape and then you say control D, control D, and it duplicates it. They're just showing us a little feature here. So we go back to PowerPoint. And we're going to go to Insert. And remember, that was a shape. Now, this time, do you see how it's in my recently used shapes? Right click. Now, remember, we never specify left click. Left click is the default mouse key if you're right handed. If you're left handed, you're doing a little translation. And I understand. I apologize. Um, but right click is the, the alternate key that we only use when we need a menu. That's what right-clicking does, is it brings up a menu. So it, here on our menu, it says Lock Drawing Mode, and that's what I want. So they want us to, how many more times? They said three, I think, right? Right-click, select Lock Drawing Mode three times to make three more shapes. Well, how about one here? <laughs> Tiny. One here, and how about one about there? Now, see how it's ready for me to keep on making more shapes? To get out of this, just press the Escape key on your keyboard. But this way I can put a whole bunch of little shapes without having to keep selecting that or, or even duplicating it. So, it says select the three new shapes, so they want all of them. I'm going to pick this first one, hold my Control key down, and then select the other two. I know I'm going to change the dimensions of them, so I'm going to go over here on my Format Shape panel, click the Size and Properties box here, and they said set the height to 1.94, Enter. Set the width, you see how they're not proportional, it stretched it out, made it look kind of funny. The width is 2.3. Five. Enter. Now, now they're looking good. And it said to set the vertical position, so I'm going to look down here, vertical position, to 2.53. So I'll just delete what I have there. 2.53. Enter. Now they're all at the same vertical position. Does that look good? 
I'm going to click so that these are not selected anymore, and I'm going to save. I just clicked in a safe blank space of my slide. Let's go back to the instructions. That was step 11 on to step number 12. So it says to select that first hexagon and set the horizontal position. Then the second one, we're going to set the horizontal position for each of these three. So that's what we're going to do. And so I think we're actually OK here because we're staying on slide number six. So I'm picking the first one. And over here, remember, I have to keep changing. It wants to you know, uh, play with the colors and that kind of thing. We are focused on size and position. So horizontal position for the first one is 4.15. Oh, I'm about to make a mistake. Don't do that. Don't do that. Escape. Oh, goodness, what just happened? I deleted. Control Z. Undo. See how I made a mistake? And I recovered by using Control Z. They didn't say the first hexagon. They said the first new hexagon. The first new hexagon. So that's the second one. And this is the one where for size and position, my horizontal, I thought something looked strange there, 4.15, press enter. They're only giving us the horizontal because the vertical is already set. So click the second one. Again, we're going to pick horizontal, 7.3, enter. And we're going to pick the third one, third new one, which is the fourth one. And so horizontal. 10.46 enter okay I'm going to click away just so that we can see the spacing is just really you know balanced on this and the height is just perfect this is really looking good save you know if I had made a mistake when they said you know first new hexagon and I read that as first hexagon if, if I had made a mistake, what would it have done? It really would have put this first one kind of on top of the second one. And I would have recognized that there was a problem. And you would too. So when you see that, just do what I do. Control Z. Get back to a point where you're comfortable where you go, OK, I know where I need to pick up. If you Control Z too many times, do you remember Control Y? So Control Z, undo. Control Y redo. So that will help you if you get into trouble. Do we save that? Save it. Let's go back to the instructions. That was step 12. On to step 13. It says now that the shapes have been inserted and positioned, you continue to build the illustration and the enrollment process by typing these names. These We're going to use those as steps. Each one of those little uh, hexagons is going to look like kind of a stepping stone. So let's go back to our PowerPoint. And we want to add some text. Now, sometimes you can double click, and it will put your insertion point in there so that you can start typing. If you have any trouble with that, if you right click, you will get this option to edit text. This will also give you the insertion point in the middle there. So the very first one, we're going to type application for this second one. And I'm going to double click, just kind of a little shortcut, financial aid in the third one. And double check your capitalization, your spelling. For the third one, we're typing advising, space, that ampersand, which is shift number seven, space, orientation. All that in one hexagon. And then the last one, and I double clicked, this is the long one, instrument, selection, ampersand, scheduling. Double check. I say that to you, I say that to me. <laughs> double check your spelling, double check your capitalization. Everything look good. Maybe I'm going to click away just to make sure it's all set up. Save. I think that was step 13. So we have some steps that are very involved, some that 
are luckily pretty straightforward. Let's go back to our instructions. Step 14. So it says to continue developing the depiction of the enrollment, we want to add these line arrows to connect our shapes. We're trying to show the flow. It's not just four steps and you can do them however you want. You need to do this and then that and then the other. So let's do that. They do give us some details here about um, the weight of the line. Uh, okay, let's just jump in and do it. Back to PowerPoint. Now I'm going to use a shape. So I'm going to insert and I'm going to go to shape. And what I want is actually something I use quite frequently, which is this line with an arrow. Now for me, it's in my recently used. You may find it under lines and it's the second one. So I click that and do you see again that my mouse has changed shapes? We started to see that in Word. We saw it in Excel. Here it is in PowerPoint, and it always tells us, you know, this is something special. Well, this is a crosshair, and the crosshair means that you're drawing. And so for the line, what I'm going to do is I really, okay, see how when I move that crosshair into the pentagon, pentagon, hexagon, sorry, not the pentagon, hexagon, that those sizing handles, they don't look right though, do they? Because they're, they're coming alive because they're connectors. And they're saying, if you want to draw a line, you should connect it and really kind of um, tape it onto one of these connectors so it will try to stay attached in that way. Great. So with my mouse over this connector, I'm going to press and drag and look at the connectors on my next hexagon light up. They're smart shapes. They're like, I see, I see we're connecting. And that's perfect. And my pointer is no longer the crosshair. It went back to the mouse, which is the selection tool. Now I see the dots. They're on the one end of my line and on the other end. And so what I'm going to do is on my keyboard, Control D. And that duplicates that shape. With that in essence copied, I'm going to move it. I'm just dragging it and I really do want it on those connectors. But do you see how they didn't light up? Well, I, I don't believe that it's attached. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put my mouse over one end of the line with that sizing handle. I'm pressing it. Now that I, I'm moving it, do you see the connectors light up on the hexagon? I'm just moving it and I want to make sure that it attached. I'm going to do the same thing here. I'm basically just dragging up and then down because it activates those connectors and I want to make sure it's attached. So now that I've done that, I'm going to do that again. Control D. <gasps> it's magic. Isn't PowerPoint smart? Isn't the software smart? We thought Excel was smart and it is. We thought Word was smart and it is, but PowerPoint, just like those other software applications, said, I think I see what you're doing. You're trying to create a pattern here. And so it's assisting us with that. We created the first arrow. When we duplicated it, it wasn't 100% sure what it should do. So we had to snap it on. And then when we duplicated it again with that Control D action, it said, let me just put it right over here. And it snapped it right on. Excellent. Let's save that. I'm going to go back to my instructions and why don't you help me double check? Oh, no, we're not finished because we did not apply the weight to the line. And I wish I would have done that before I duplicated it because now I kind of have to do it to all three, whereas before I would have just had to do it to the one and when I copied it. Oh, well, made a little mistake. Let's go back and fix so the grader doesn't get us. This one is already selected. I'm going to hold my control key down while I click this line and I'm going to keep my control key down as I click that one. So all three of your lines should be selected. You should not see dots around any of your hexagons, only the lines. With all three of them selected, I'm going to come up here to shape outline, weight, and then the weight should be four and a half. So you see a lot thicker. Select that and save. Now with that one, as I go back to the instructions, 
Let's just double check. I think we've done it. I think we've done it, that one. So guess what? We get to scroll along. We are already at page three at step 15. So let's do that one. With step 15, it says we're going to work on slide number five, and we're going to start to do a little formatting. We're going to add some text, lots of pieces in here, many pieces of, and parts of our instructions. So make sure, double check me on this, folks. Let's follow each part of these instructions. Let's go back to our PowerPoint. Let's go to slide number five. This is performance program, and we're going to put a text box on this page. So I'm going to insert. And there are there's more than one way to add a text box. If you'd like, just come down here to this text category. Click one time on text box. And they want it somewhere on the left side. And they tell us approximately 5 inches wide and 2 inches tall. But honestly, we're going to set it more precisely later on. So let's just do the best we can. What we're practicing with is these rulers. OK, so first of all, see how my mouse is not the pointer selection mouse. It's also not really a crosshair. This is the shape that it looks like when you're going to put text in. So. When I move this mouse, I want you to look up at the top at my rulers. If your rulers are not displayed, click on View and then check the ruler box. But with my mouse moving back and forth, see how I'm at the 5 inch mark? That's going to be nice because then when I click and press, I don't just click and let up, I press and drag, I'll be able to go from the 5 inch mark all the way over to the 1 inch mark and I'll know that's about 5 inches. Similarly, if you look along the left ruler area, can you see my mouse, right? And you can see where I'm going to position the text box. Well, they want it about 2 inches tall. So, you know, they didn't say where, so I could start at the 2 inch mark if I wanted or I could start maybe at one inch and I can drag past zero, which is the middle, down to negative one. And that would be two inches. So I'm going to do that. Now, here's another trick. When I press and drag, I don't need to go in a square pattern because that's not how it works. I work in a diagonal pattern. So I'm going to start at about the one inch mark uh, on the left and the five inch mark at the top. I'm pressing, holding my mouse button down. I am dragging diagonally until I can see at the ruler that I am across approximately. It's not doesn't have to be precise and down the desired dimensions. Release the mouse. There it is. Now what happens if I didn't get it just right? No problem. Use your sizing handles. The ones in the middle go only one direction. This one will only go in and out. The ones on the top, in and out, up and down. The corners let you do both. So most of the time people will use the corners because that way I can uh, make it taller or shorter as well as uh, you know wider or less wide. Okay, so you can you can move it. But right now. That's good, but I want you to be aware of that because sometimes we are trying to position things very precisely. Now, my insertion point is clicking inside of this container, this text box, and we're going to type a song in our, oops, in our hearts, dot, 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 enter, enter, brings with a capital B, happiness to our faces exclamation point. Double check spelling, double check capitalization. Does it look good? Now I want to select all this font and I'll tell you a little trick. Control A. Remember how Control A selects all? Well, all within its container. And so we're inside this text box container. It selects all the text within the container. With that selected, I am going to change the font size to 40. And I'm going to change the color to be consistent. You've got it to the dark 
blue accent four. Click that. Save that. That's some good work. I liked it's just my personal habit to click away so that it, it kind of sets up, right? That was step 15. On to step 16. Now we're going to set the height of the text box to three and a half inches and 5.1 inch, uh, yeah, 3.5, yeah, height and width 5.1. Then we're going to set the horizontal and vertical positions. So let's go ahead and do that. But we learned a lot as we were working on that. I'm going to select the box, and I like to put my mouse over this edge so that I have the box selected, the text box. With that selected, we're going back to our good old size and properties icon, and they said the height should be 3.5. Enter. The width should be 5.1. Enter. The horizontal position should be 1.5. Enter. And the vertical position is going to be 2.3. Enter. Excellent. Save that. I like to click away. That's, it's my personal preference. And then go back to Word. So that was what? Step 16, I believe. All right. Moving on. Oh, this gets fun. Step 17. I hope you loved this in the simulation, you know, because a lot of these steps, hopefully you're recognizing from the simulation activity. So we're going to do some cool stuff with the heart shape. So let's go back to our PowerPoint presentation, and we're going to make this heart, and we're going to put a picture into the heart. Isn't that cool? I could see this for birthday celebrations, um, honoring you know people who are having like maybe a silver or gold wedding anniversary, something like that. Wouldn't this just be so awesome? Okay, let's go back to PowerPoint. And oh, I forgot to look what slide. We're still slide five. We need to be on slide five, which we are. And so we're going to go to Insert Shapes, and this time we need a heart. And heart, yeah is going to be under basic shapes. If you've used it recently, again, it'll be up in recently used. But basic shapes, here it is, heart. I've got my crosshair. Now again, to draw, you just go diagonal. So press and drag. Press and drag. Don't worry too much about what the heart looks like because you're going to fix it. In fact, sometimes if you click and let up, it'll make a little bitty heart <laughs> or a little bitty shape. Don't worry because we're going to fix that size in just a moment. Okay, so speaking of that, it says it's someplace here on the right and we have it selected. We need to go to our format shape panel. Click on that. Remember that if this panel cl is closed for any reason, you know, maybe you haven't been doing this whole greater presentation. You're doing something personal and you want that panel. Right click and format shape. That's how you get that panel. You just right click, format whatever you're clicking on. Over here, size and properties. And they told us to set the height and width to 5.5. So height is 5.5. Enter, and width is 5.5. Yeah, there we go. Mine's kind of going off the page, but that's okay. In the horizontal position, we're going to fix that. It says 6.9. Enter. In the vertical position, it says 1.85. Enter. Now it's looking a little better, but we're not done yet. This is where we get to have fun. Still in this format shape, this is where you're going to insert a picture. So the paint bucket is normally where we think to apply some kind of color. Well, there's so many things you can do here. Transparency, you can make that color so that you can see through it, which sometimes you can do that. For example, uh, I use that sometimes to make text appear highlighted. I'll put a square over it, and I'll make the square yellow, but I'll make it transparent so that you can see the text through it. Just giving you some ideas on how to, to make these things. 
Another thing that I can do, in addition to just solid fills or gradient fills, remember we looked at a texture fill in Excel for one of our charts? Well, how about a picture? Oh, well, not that picture, but okay, that kind of is a cool picture. Uh, insert, and we need to get the picture from a file on our computer. Now, remember you need to navigate to wherever you saved your files. For me, it's on the desktop. And I always organize, in this case, into PowerPoint 2 folder. Well, there's children. That's the picture. Insert. Oh, isn't that so cool? That is just so special to me. I mean, you look like you're graphic artist, don't you? We're not quite done. Can you see that kind of black border that goes, or red border, whatever border that is that goes around? They don't want any border there, so that's okay. We'll come up here to, oops, not to text outline, to shape. So avoid text outline. We're looking at shape outline. And the heart is still selected. Click on that, and we want no outline. I actually liked the outline, but they want us to take it off, so we did. So I'll save. Does that look good? All right, let's go back to our instructions because believe it or not, and I feel we need to just double check step 17. Do you think we did everything? I think we did. I think we've got all those steps. Excellent. On to step 18. Select the four hexagon shapes on slide six and make the following changes. So they've listed them all out here. We're gonna apply a gradient fill and notice that they say this whole, this is all one, describes one setting. Gradient fill, brown, accent three, no outline. And it's in this presets group. And that's true for this one as well. There's a shape effect and that is also a preset. And there's a outline. Okay, so we're going to put an outline around a shape in this dark blue accent four. Okay, let's go back to our PowerPoint. And we're supposed to be on slide six. This is our four shapes. Now, they said to select the hexagons. They did not say the lines. So I'm going to click the first hexagon. I'm going to hold my control key down and click each of the others. Now you see they're all selected, and so they want that gradient style from the presets. Okay, this was under our shape style. So I'm on my shape format ribbon. I'm going to expand. You saw that, right? The shape styles down here in the presets. Now I know it's brown. Oh, okay, good, 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 good. This, you know, doing the simulations kind of helps you because you know you can find things faster. So gradient fill brown, accent three, no outline. Pick that one. Now we're not done yet. Still with all those shapes selected, we're going to apply a shape effect. See that up here? Click on that drop down, and they did say it was one of our presets, and specifically preset three. Well, let's see, one, two, three, is it this one? It is. Number three, click that one. All right, see how it gave it a little beveled edge there, kind of like the light is hitting off of it. We have one more step, and that is to apply a shape outline. So that we're gonna do from over here. Click on that. And remember, we've been working a lot with this theme color, this dark blue accent four, so pick that just makes that edge a little bit harder. You can see it better if you click away somewhere. You can see the impact of your work. That's looking pretty sharp. Let's save that. Let's go back to our instructions. That, what step was that? That was step 18. And on to step 19. You add an icon to depict an email address. People look for those things nowadays, don't they? They really want to be able to quickly see, you know, Facebook icon, a Twitter icon, an Instagram icon, a TikTok icon, whatever it is, so that they can quickly find it. So in this case, an email icon. So we're going to be on slide seven, and we're going to set, you know, position, horizontal, that, and we're going to change the color. So let's go back. Lots of steps here. Don't miss any. Let's go back. I'm sorry, and they said slide seven. Here we are. 
and they want to insert an icon. And so if you look across, here's the icons. And what I'm going to do is in the search box, I'm going to type email. And you may have to press enter. You may not have to press enter. Now, I believe it's this first one. Yeah, first row, first column. Just double checking. This one, and then insert. There it is. Look at my designer is saying, I can help you. Let's make it look like this. I want it, I don't need that designer, so I'm going to close that. I'm going to select that because I want to make sure that it is selected. And I'm going to make some changes. We're going to come over to our properties here. And the height, we want 1.4. Enter. Okay, and that set the width as well. And that's because the lock aspect ratio is set. And that's fine. Down here in position, the horizontal position should be 2.1 enter. The vertical position should be 3.5. Ah, this is looking good now. And it did say though that we want to set the fill color to dark blue accent 4. So graphic fill, I'm on my graphics format ribbon, graphics fill, and we kind of got this one memorized I think, dark blue accent 4. So there it is. Looks good. Did we do all the steps for that? I think so. I'm going to click away. Yeah, that looks good. Save that. Back to our instructions. That was step 19. Goodness, I'm going to scroll down on to step 20. We're getting close to page 3. Now we have a very full page 4. So we got to keep our focus. We've got to stay strong here. Oh, but we're going to get to do some um, animations and that's the fun stuff. So uh, let's see, we're going to capture the audience's participation in step 20. We're going to apply an animation called Fade and we're going to do this to our hexagon uh, with this and then we're going to use something called the Animation Painter and apply the same animations to the others. And that can also be very helpful. So let's do that. Uh, on Back to our PowerPoint. And we were on step 20, so let's see, we're on our hexagons. I don't think... They told us the slide there. Oh, slide six. Yeah, just to make sure. Slide six. So I'm going to pick this first hexagon, and I'm going to the tab that says animations. Now, just to clarify, animations make an object on the page move or react in a certain way. Transitions is when we go between slides from one slide to another. Sometimes it's those words just start to get confusing, animations and transitions, but animations is something on that particular page. Okay, so with that said, we have our first one selected. We're on the animations ribbon. And as I start to look across, I see fade. And I'm going to click that and when I do, watch our image. That's what it's, it's going to look like. It's going to do this little uh, type of fade. Now, something that confuses people oftentimes is that you don't necessarily see these animations except in that brief moment where you first apply it. So if you were to open a PowerPoint that somebody else emailed to you, in this slide deck view, remember we talked about slide deck in the previous video? The slide deck is the behind the scenes. This is where you do all the editing. But when you play the, the show, that's when you get to see the animation. So let me show you something before we go too much further. I'm going to close this panel, this format background panel. And I'm going to open the animation pane. Do you see this button here? Because in this animation pane, one thing that I can do is I can play. Now, I only have one animation, so it, it's not that exciting. But I want you to see if I play. Did you see it? This is one way that I, now if I had 10 animations, it would play them all. 
Okay, it would go from the first one I had selected onward. Another way that I can see my animations is to actually play the show, to run the show. And if I'm working on this particular slide, I don't want to go back to, I'm on slide six, I don't want to go back to slide number one. So come down here, remember we talked about these little icons down here? Notice this one that says slideshow. It starts from the current slide. I cannot tell you how many times I am in some presentation and the only thing that the person knows is to press F5. And F5 starts the show from the beginning. And they'll go, oh, wait a minute. And they have to press enter, I don't know, like 50 times to go through so many things until they get to the point that they want. Don't do that. Just right here, click that slideshow. Okay, now, you see how nothing is happening right now? because the, the animation is set to start on click. I clicked, there's my animation. I realize we don't have a lot to look at right now, but I want you to see that you don't see it when you're in the, the editing mode. So how do I get out of this? You escape, you can hit the escape key on your keyboard. Okay, so let us continue on. We were on step number 20. We applied that animation to this very first one. I have it selected up here in my animation area, advanced animation. This is where it says animation painter. Click. Did you see the little paintbrush? Well, it just applied the animation from here. It painted it onto this one. Now I have this one selected, so I'm going to do that again. Click and that sucks up onto the paintbrush that's attached to my mouse. So I have to start with what by selecting what already has the format. Then I paint it onto the area that I want. One more time. I've got, this one now has it. See them lining up here in my animation pane? It has the settings. Click the animation painter and click. And I just painted it. What would this look like? Well, we can come down here to the slideshow. Now, my, my arrows are not animated. If I click, there's my first one. Click, there's my second one. Click, there's my third one. Click, there's my fourth one. I want to get out, escape. All right, save that. Now, I do just want to, oh, goodness, uh-oh, the arrows, let me go back to my instructions. I missed a step because it did say the arrows. I should have applied the same animation to the arrows. Okay, that's okay. I, I'm actually kind of glad we caught it at this point. We're going to learn a couple extra steps. Very real world because real world, you're not going to have the instructions to follow. You're going to make a change and then make a change and then make a change and you do need to know how to reposition and reorder uh, your animations. So let's do that real quick. Back to PowerPoint. Now, we know if we click any of these shapes, they already have the setting on it, right? So Animation Painter, can I double click that? Let's try that. And I'm going to click this arrow. Do you see it fade? I'm going to click this arrow, and I'm, oh good, and it's sticking, and I'm going to click that arrow. So now I have seven things that are animated. I'm still in this painter mode. I'm going to click that again to get out. But what is the problem? I bet you already know. When I go into my slideshow, if I click, there's my shape. Then I click my next shape, but where's my arrow? My shapes are coming in first because that's the way that I added the animation. And then since I added the arrows at the end, they're coming in at the end. Now, there could be some reasons that you want to do that. You may want to have them come in and then change them. But that's not what the automatic grader is expecting. It wants this shape and then this arrow, this shape and then this arrow, and so on. Escape to get out of the show. Can you see over here in this panel that here's your four hexagons and here's your three arrows? So I'm going to click this first arrow. If I have any doubt about what is selected, do you see how it has the number five? 
look over in your PowerPoint. Do you see how the number five is a different color? It's letting you know that that's selected. It works both ways. When I click in the panel, it says, hey, this is what's selected. If I click the arrow, it would, in fact, let me click this one, like number six. See how it changed what was selected over here? If I click number seven, it makes number seven selected. So these two panels or areas stay in sync. Well, what do I want selected? I want number five, straight arrow selected. And I'm just going to put my mouse over that, press and drag to position it between the first two hexagons. Now I'm going to do that again between three and four. So here's my straight arrow. Press and drag after the second hexagon. And then finally, last straight arrow, press and drag. Got it? One other thing, if you have trouble with the motor skills here, if I have something selected, uh, let me select this very last hexagon. Do you see these keys over here, or these buttons? If I press this, did you see it move my hexagon? So I can move that hexagon up as many times as I need to, or down. So if you're having trouble with the dragging, then just pick the shape you want to move and use these arrows to move it. Let's make sure that things are in the proper order. Slideshow. Click. Click. Excellent. They're coming in in the right order. If not, you go back to editing and you put them in the correct order. Escape to go back into the slide deck. I'm going to save that because I think that's exactly what we need to do. And that was step 20. Double check me on that. I think we've got it. So on to step 21. So now we're going to apply that fade animation that we've been working with. We're being very consistent to the bulleted list on slide two. And it says that we're going to set the start to after previous. They didn't tell us to do that up here, did they? I don't think so. Okay, and they even are giving us a duration between the fades and a delay time. Okay, let's do it. Note to Mac users, to set the delay, this is what you need to do. So pay attention to that. Let's go back to PowerPoint. We need to go to slide two, and I am selecting the text. I can click anywhere in there and control A, or you can select, drag over all of it. And this was step 21. So we're going to go up here to the animations. And I feel remiss if I didn't tell. I mean, fade is the one we want. It's right here. But you know there's, look at, I mean, there's so many exciting ones. There's all kinds of things you can do and even more that we're going to explore. But for now, we're being consistent. We don't want to get crazy, okay, because it will make people nauseous as part of our presentation. We don't want to do that. Just click fade. So do you see what happened? Let's look over in this animation uh, pane. The first one has a little number one, and then all of them have a number one. What does that mean? Well, when we go into the show, nothing's happening. Then we click, and they all three come in at once. That's not what we were probably wanting. So I'm hitting escape, and that's the reason for the next instruction. All three are still uh, selected, and we don't want one click to make all these things happen, and that's what that number one means. It means on the first click, all these things happen. And do you see these green timeline bars? That's what they are. They're for a timeline. And what they're showing is that the time it takes to display is pretty short, and that it all happens simultaneously. That's not what we want. All three of them are selected and up here, see where it says on click? Click that drop down box and they want us to change that to after previous. Now when I do that, watch these little uh, timelines. You see how they changed? So this one will run and then this one will run, and then the next one will run. And there's no mouse click. It says zero because it means as soon as we go into the slide. So let's look at it again. See how they came up? One right after the other? 
pretty cool. These are the kinds of things that I love the simulation because it teaches you how to and it really makes sure you get those steps. But when you're really working on a file, that's when you get to see it. But you do want to take the time and know what you're looking for. And I hope that's what this video uh, helps you with is to see what you're looking for. Two more steps as part of this instruction. You may have noticed when we went into slideshow how fast everything happened. And that's why up here they want us to give the duration and they also want us to put a delay between these two steps. So the duration and watch these green bars. I'm going to set the duration to 0.75. Now as soon as I press enter, look at these green bars. I'm going to press enter. Did you see them get just a little bit longer? So that means it's going to take just a little bit longer for each word to display. It gives the audience time to read it. But if they're all flying in really fast, we may need just a, a minute, a brief nanosecond to, to actually digest the first bullet before the second one comes in. So where it says delay, we are also going oops, I'm trying to select that. We are also going to put 0.75 enter. Now I haven't pressed enter yet. Look at the spacing between the green boxes. I'm going to press enter. Oh, you almost can't really see, can you? Well this little panel here, do you see where I put my mouse? I can press and drag to make it bigger. Oh, and I would think, there we go. I had to click on the first one so that it would move that timeline over. Can you see now, and in fact, it's even trying to show you that with these lines that are coming down, that it's saying this one will stop, and then there will be a 0.75 delay, and then the second one will start. So this is what it looks like now. I'm going to go into slideshow. Isn't that a nicer pace? Now, to be honest, this is often where you see the speaker and they have a, one of those little clickers in their hand. Uh, and when they click, each time they click, a new point comes up. But if you are really concerned that you need to keep a certain pace, you may want to have them come in at a certain time as a prompt to keep you moving forward in your presentation. So you don't get hung up and talk for five minutes about instructions, run out of time, and you never get to talk about performance program. Okay, so I'm going to escape, but you saw how the duration and delay impacts your presentation. Awesome, save that. So you, you get the why, you understand why you're doing these things. I think we finished that step. Let's go on to step 22. Step 22 is on slide 7, and we're going to, they very specifically here say, select the placeholder border with the email information and apply the fade animation. They say as an entrance animation. Well, that's kind of what it does by default is entrance. So let's go there and let's do it. PowerPoint, down to slide number 7, and they said the placeholder with the email information. So they want the whole container. I'm going to collect, click on the border of that box. So where are my sizing handles? Showing what's selected and no flashing insertion point in there. With this selected, so look at we've done this for bullets, we've done this for a picture, right? Uh, you know, for, or for a, a shape. Now here we're going to do this to text fade. You see how it played as it came in? They did not tell us to change how it came in, but what would happen is we would get to this slide and we would say, first of all, see, we'd realize that we may want this to fade in also. See how showing it helps your perspective of what needs to be done? But we might say, are there any questions? No. Well, if you think of any questions later, I clicked, Here's my contact information and you can contact me, right? See how that works to draw the audience's attention? And you've seen things like this. Now you know how to do it. Excellent. Save that. I think we've done all of that step. step. Let's go back to the instruction. This should be step 22 on to step 23. Now step 23, very interesting. We are adding a second animation. 
for emphasis to the content placeholder. So we're going to select that content placeholder with the email information again, it says, and we're going to add animation. Uh, I'm going to make sure you point this out because you might wipe out your previous animation. So we need to make sure we're adding a second one. And we're going to go into this advanced animation group and we're going to do a bold reveal in the emphasis. So this is often the reason why you add a second animation and that is to add emphasis. So let's go back to our, uh, they didn't tell us, but presumably still slide seven. So we're still on slide seven. Uh, select, make sure you've got the text box. If not, click on that text box. Make sure you've got the entire placeholder. So here is the caution, folks. If you come up here and you just click on, they want a bold reveal. If you just come up here and click on another uh, animation, what's going to happen is fade will be replaced by whatever new animation you choose. Instead, you want to come over here and add the animation. Now, notice they've gotten them broken down by categories. This would be for an entrance. This would be to add emphasis. And again, that's kind of what we're going for. Sometimes you want something to exit, right? You've talked about it. Now you want it to fly off the screen. You could do that, or you're going to reveal something by having a box that covers it, exit. Well, they've actually told us that we need to come down. Be, well, they want bold reveal, and I actually see it right here. We could pick it there, but they weren't really wanted us to, um, I think, look at all of these. So I'm going to click on this, more emphasis effects, just so you can see. Look at all these cool things you can do. Make it kind of change colors, go transparent, darken, um, you have a contrast. These are all, it says subtle. You can have it pulse a little bit, shimmer a little bit, do a wave. Those are fun. The letters kind of do a wave. You could do that or you could bold. Now my little preview effect is uh, selected. So as soon as I click this bold reveal, did you see it? It went bold for a minute. So I'm going to click OK and look at that. I now have two effects they're actually both on this. One, one and two are both on this. You can kind of see the timelines. Let's, uh, let's see. Oh, they have more. What step was that? Make sure I don't miss anything. There's a note for Mac users on how to do that. But nope, that looks good. What does that look like? Go into Slideshow. Click to make it appear. Click Emphasis. Wasn't that cool? If you're ever presenting and you say, oops, I didn't mean for that animation to happen, you can backspace. Every time you backspace, it, it takes it away. It actually does not delete when you're in the show. And then you can use your Enter key. These are just multiple ways to present. Escape. All right, so we're really starting to see some things now. Save that. Let's go back to the instructions. That was step 23 on to step 24, which they tell us is slide five. And they said, select very specific sum of the text here and apply the expand entrance animation. And we're going to set that to start after previous, so we don't have to click every time. We're going to set the duration and we're going to set the delay. So let's go back to our PowerPoint, slide number five. Now, we only want this last part of the text. So see how I selected brings happiness to our faces, including that little exclamation point. If you think, and I might have selected too much, you know, remember you can be very precise using your shift arrow key. I, I don't know if it matters. Sometimes the automatic grader is picky, so that's what I did. With that selected, we've got our animations here and we want to apply the expand entrance. So these are entrances. I don't see expand, so I'm going to expand my list. Now these are, again, all the entrances and it's a kind of a quick reference list. I'm gonna, I don't see it, so I'm gonna come down here to more entrance effects. I mean, look, I have a ton, and I can look through all of these, but under Subtle, in the Subtle category, 
see expand now again my preview box is selected so when I click expand wa watch this text as I click it Ooh, cool click OK now you kind of have an idea of what's going to happen but if you want to verify you go into show and I have to click now they told us they don't want us to have to click they want us I hit escape to get back that animation is selected and up here I'm going to click after previous now alternatively you can access a menu here and I also could have used after previous here okay just two different ways of doing that so again with this selected they want the duration to be 1.25 enter and they want the delay to be 1 so save that and here's the difference go into your show I did not click it came in very slowly so you get you have time to read a song in our hearts and then brings happiness to faces oh right escape I love it I think this is a great one save that just to make sure and as we go back to our instructions that is going to be the end of page three so let's continue on to page four now it's a very full page because we have 33 total instructions here so let's keep going it says you're going to use the animation pane and we have been looking at that but to make some adjustments to the animation so we're going to look at that let's go to slide seven on slide seven it says we're going to select and they're very clear here the content placeholder we've got the whole thing selected otherwise as we've seen we could affect just some of the text and we don't want to do that we have our animation pane open which we did by clicking this button and it says to select the first animation so just where it enters the page and set that to start after okay now you may be saying after what after the page displays so I'm gonna click start after okay so now it should see how it's got a little clock there instead of the mouse I'm surprised they're not having me do the second one that's confusing me so again if I go into my show see how it came right in but the second animation does not begin until I click so we're seeing how this is working save that go back to our instructions that was step 25 on to step 26 so step 26 says to add motion when one slide changes into another we are going to apply transitions so not animations but transitions and we're going to do this to all the slides and we're going to apply something called the push transition and we're going to really configure that transition so that it starts from the left has a certain duration and so let's do that now if I'm going to work with transitions and especially when I'm going to apply them to all of the slides I'm not really interested in in the editing the details of the slide for that reason I'm going to go to this slide sorter view love this view right now I have slide 7 selected do you see how it has a darker border around it if I were to change and select slide 1 do you see how slide 7 is not selected and this one is well if I want to select all the slides how do we select all control a everything within the container and in this case that's all these slides so it's so control a has selected all the slides and up here towards the top I'm gonna to click on the transitions ribbon and as I look there's all kinds of transitions and I encourage you to explore these but the one we're interested in is push and I'm going to click it and then you can watch this it's demonstrating it for you so it's pushing the new slide in from the bottom and they don't want that they want it to come in from the left so towards the end of these transitions here's my effect options and they want it to come in from the left 
See how it's changed? Aren't you just spiffy? Are you just proud of yourself right now? You should be. For the duration, they want it to take 1.25, so just a little more delay, 1.25, enter. And it all the slides are selected, and therefore they, they are all affected. If you have any doubt, click Apply to All. Now, it didn't demonstrate that for me, but if I, I'm going to go to slide, which slide? We're getting ready to edit slide three. So what I'll do is I'll click that one to select it, and then I'll double click it to return. What happened here is I got out of slide sorter, and I returned to what they call normal view. Let's just say I wanted to see what happened. If I go into my show, do you see it push in? And when I transition to the next slide, there it is. Okay, so this is what those transitions look like. And I'm going to hit, oh, and see my animation? Excellent. See, it adds interest, doesn't it? All right, I'm going to hit Escape. And we need to be on slide three for our next step. Now, this step, we are going to add, and I could, let me show you this in the instructions, um, for uh, number 27 here, we're going to add a video that shows some children participating in one of the school's recent events. So we're going to insert, it says, that violins video into our uh, PowerPoint. Now this is going to make it big and you're going to see that the clip is actually pretty small, but the size was big. So let's go back to our PowerPoint, slide three, and we have this nice placeholder right here. And if I look inside, there's one little icon that's for inserting videos. I'm going to click that. Make sure you navigate to your files. And that's where you should find violins. Insert. Put it right in that placeholder. Oh, and my design ideas is trying to help me. So now here's what it did. It took that video file and it embedded it into your PowerPoint presentation. This is not the same as, for example, if you put a link to, let's say, a YouTube video. It actually took that file and it pushed it into your PowerPoint. So when we save this, our PowerPoint just got bigger because it said bloop and it took in that video. Now, we saw how big that video was earlier. Let's just go into the show so that we can see. We still have work to do, but I want you to understand what you're doing. We're going into the show. Here it is. Now, it doesn't even, we can't even tell that it's a video right now, can we? I had to put my mouse over the top of it. We're going to change that, but my mouse is over the top of it. And you see now I've got the controls and I'm going to click play. This video does not have sound. We're going to add the sound in just a moment. So think about that in terms of the size as well. Okay, you see it stopped? That was a short video. But it's pretty large, but that's okay. Escape. I go back to editing. Let's see what else it wanted us to do. Well, that was step 27, so, so far, so good. Save that. Go back to the instructions. Step 28. Let me scroll up a little bit so you can see. Here's step 28. Here's where this poster thing comes in. I believe that you will need to be in PowerPoint 2021 to complete this step. It says you apply a poster frame and a video style to the inserted uh, video. What is a poster frame? Have you ever um, uploaded something to YouTube and it has you with your mouth opened in a really bizarre way. So the initial thumbnail picture that people see is a very awkward picture. You don't want that. You instead want to upload perhaps your own thumbnail of what should display or pick a different thumbnail within that video. That's the poster frame. And so that's what PowerPoint is allowing us to do. When somebody first comes to this slide, perhaps we don't want them to to see the actual start of the video. We want them to see something that is more appropriate. So that's what we're going to do. It says, click or press move forward to point 
two five seconds on the media control bar to advance the video to the frame at, I mean, this is just a lot in my opinion. We're going to advance the video to that 0.75 seconds. And then we're going to set a poster frame to that current frame. Okay, um, and then we're going to apply center shadow rectangle video style. It's kind of like the picture style when we get to that style. Let's go back to our PowerPoint. And we need to advance this. And I'm going to click on this to select it. When I do, notice I have more tools up here at the top. I have video format, and this can be really, really handy. See, my there's my poster frame button. I, I'm not ready for it yet, but that's... That's what I have here. First, they want me to advance. Now, I also want to look at playback. Um, for some reason, I was thinking I could very specifically advance. Let me go back to video format. They want me, now here's my timer. And if you remember, it's all zeros to 0.75. So let me... Oops, I've got to go back just a little. I can also, see now, now that I have this played a little bit, I can move my mouse. Gosh, oops, there it is. But I say you have to be really precise. Oh, and I'm flinched apparently just a little. Ugh. I feel like there's a better way to do that. If so, somebody can post. Why won't it go back? Oh. I'm going to pause. My computer has locked up for just a moment, so I'm going to pause. Hi, folks. So I paused my video for a minute because my computer did kind of freeze because I'm trying to, you know, record while I'm working with this recording. And um, I wanted you to see that this is the reason it's so important to save as you go because you never know when something like this is going to happen. I'm kind of in this death spiral right now where... I'm just sitting here, and uh, there's nothing I can do. My uh, screen is frozen, so uh, I don't even think I can I close it. Okay, it let me click the X, so I'm going to close the program. I just wanted to be transparent here. And I'm going to reopen, so I'll pause the video while, okay, well, it did it. I don't want to waste your time, but I think these are practical things that we all experience. And uh, I'm human, and it happens to me too. And I make mistakes, and I just try to uh, I try to show those to you or share those with you in a transparent way without wasting too much of your time. So um, hopefully that works. Okay, so what we were trying to do, I'm so glad uh, we've saved everything. So the video is here, so I feel confident that we can resume step number 28 where our goal was to move it says advance the video to the frame at 0 0.75 Let's see if i can do a little better oh i can do 72 and 74 but just not okay let's just keep i'm going to get close i'm going to just try to get as close as i can that's 0 0.74 if the grader marks me wrong, then I'm going to know that that's the reason, okay? <laughs> so um, here it is, and up here on video format, if you remember, this is where we had this poster frame. And if I click on that drop down, notice it says current frame or image from file. Well, I'm just clicking squarely on it, which is going to be the current frame. So you may have a different image that you want to put in. So I'm going to select that. And see how it now it says poster frame is set, and so it's keeping this is what it's still going to start the play from the beginning. It's just going to show that as the picture. With this set, then we're going to apply a video style, and the one we want is center shadow rectangle. Oh, second one, center shadow rectangle. Click that. Now, I am going to save. I just want to kind of keep on saving. And that was step 28. Step 29, the entire instruction reads, set the video to start automatically. And so we're going to do that. I'm going to come up here to play. And what we can do is under start, click this drop down. 
and automatically. Another thing that you can do is right click and you'll see that you have options like even the style, trimming, all kinds of things, the start, and you could also choose that there. So just don't forget that right clicking option. I clicked away, uh, but my video is still selected. So let's go back to the instruction. Oh, let's save that. Let's go back to the instructions. And as you can see, we just completed step 29 on to step 30. Now on step 30, it says this is where this audio is going to come in. We're going to insert the audio. We're going to move the icon you're going to see. And we're going to set that to start automatically and hide when we're playing the video. So a couple steps going on here. Back to PowerPoint. We're still on slide 3. I'm going to insert something, and I, I don't have any little icons to click on, so I'm going to go Insert. And way down here towards the end, there's Video, there's Audio. So Audio, this is an audio on my computer. I need to navigate to my PowerPoint files for this assignment. There's my Violin Audio. Insert. This is the sound icon. It's Remember, this sound is separate from this video. Anytime you insert a sound, um, it puts this. Now, I'm going to tell you what some people do. If you're going to have it start automatically and you don't need to operate these play controls, put it off of the slide. Move it out here so that it's not visible. So just keep that in mind. That's kind of a, a way old trick that people have been using for years. Put it up here in the corner because that's what they asked us to do on step number 30. And they said they want it to start automatically. Start automatically. So it's going to start automatically and the video is going to start automatically, right? And then they said they want to hide it during the show. And that's, check this box right here. It's going to hide during the show and it's going to start automatically. That was step 30. So what do we have right now? Let's save that and let's look at it. Go into my show. Hmm. It's not really working the way we thought, is it? But my icon's not showing. Ah. Okay, so we know that we have sound, we know that we have video, but they're not working the way that we thought they would. That's what we're going to do in the next instruction, which is instruction 31. It says you need to coordinate the audio and video to play simultaneously. So open the animation uh, pane on slide 3 and select the uh, violin audio and move it up so that it's first and then the video is second. Set the video to start with previous so that they play at the same time. And then it says click play from. And remember how we looked at that a minute ago so that we could actually see what it looks like. So go back into PowerPoint. Make sure we display our animation page. So let me go to uh, animation because that's actually what these are. They're two animations that start automatically. Animation. Now trigger that's a something later. Don't worry about that. Look at these two at the top. Here's uh, violin audio. Press drag or else use your little arrow keys here to move it up. Now it still doesn't understand to, to start at the same time. They wanted us to select violins. That's the movie. And we can use this little drop down arrow here. And instead of start after we want it to start with previous. So they should be starting together. We could have also selected it here and used this box. Now they want us to check it out by clicking play from. Uh oh, I don't think I have it quite right. You know what happened? Because I had the second one selected. So it played from that point and it played only that one. I would have had to pick the first one. I apologize. Here we go. So we get to sample that. And that's what Play From does, is it basically lets you preview from the point that you've selected. You know I want to see this in the show. Let's see it in its glory.
Excellent. I could let I hit escape and it stopped the animation. I'm hitting escape and it's going back into editing. Perfect. Let's save that. So all we did is move the uh, violin audio first and we set the video to start after previous. Uh, I'm sorry, the violins to start with previous. Back to our instructions. That was a biggie. That was step 31. Let me scroll down a little bit more. This, folks, step 32 is an important step, and I mentioned it in the previous grader for chapter one. These pictures and these videos and all, they take up a lot of space. So we want to get in the practice of compressing them. And that's what this step is about. Now, they're having us compress in two different ways. They're having us to compress the pictures themselves. That's what the first part of this is doing. We're starting on slide five, okay? But they're also having us compress, when they say go to the file tab, they're having us compress everything. Now, Mac users, notice the note here. It says uh, you can compress the pictures, but compressing media is not available. Okay, so let's do this because, like I said, it's two different parts here, compressing the pictures and then compressing the entire file. So we're going into uh, PowerPoint. And they tell you to start at slide one, but it's really they just want you to... Um, to see the the show they um, what did they want you to do on oh on the slideshow tab they said uh, from beginning and a lot of people do this and they're not aware that you can start the show from anywhere by using those small buttons but they wanted you to see your work oh I'm sorry I clicked and it made it uh, advance all right we get it escape escape we're gonna go to slide five because I know this is getting long and we're going to select this picture. Now, when I have the picture selected, um, across the top I have my two extra tabs here, shape format and, um, yeah, shape format and picture format. I need to be on picture format. When I'm on picture format, I have this compress pictures option. Click that. Now, here's kind of a weird thing. It's a good thing. Look at these options at the top. It says apply only to this picture. You may assume the default would be to apply to all pictures. In fact, the default is to apply only to this one. We want to apply to all of the pictures in our presentation. So deselect that. Here's another important thing. Remember last grader I talked about cropping pictures and that somebody can kind of uncrop what you've done? Well, here it says delete cropped areas of the picture. Keep that selected because you want that. Anytime you've trimmed off a piece of that picture, you want it. Go away. You don't want to bring it back. So, you know, provided you're, that's what you want. So keep that selected. Now down here it says how much should I compress it? And that's going to affect the quality of the picture. Well, they tell us web 150. And see, and it tells you, good for web pages and, and projectors, as opposed to if you're going to print it or, you know, put it on a screen or email it even. Look how small it's going to get when you email it. So the resolution would be worse for this email option. So in this case, we're saying web. It doesn't mean you can't email it. You could email it. It's just, a, you know, going to be a bigger file. Click OK. And remember, this is applying to all the pictures. So I'm going to save that, and right away, our file size got a little bit smaller. It was probably a little bit bigger, and now it's a little bit smaller. But we're not done yet. We're going to compress the entire file. In fact, let's look at it before we do it. I'm going to close this just for a minute. Have we saved it? Let's save it. And I'm going to close this. And I'm... I'm I'm even going to close this because, well, I'm going to memorize because we know what that is. Here's the file we've been working on. Look how big it is. And it contains this video file. So let's just kind of jot this down for a minute. 4,636 kilob kilobytes. Okay, that's how big it is right now. I'm going to put this over here so that, um, well, I need to make it smaller so that we can remember this size. And let's just see. Let's see if it changes. I'm going to reopen it so that we can complete this last step. 
I'm going to go to File, and I'm going to go to Info, and under Info, do you see this option that says Compress Media? So I'm going to click on that, and they suggest the 480, the standard. It says use when space is limited, such as when sending presentations via email. And so you can pick your options here. But I'm, we're going to do standard because that's what we were instructed to do. See it going through? It's compressing. Compression, it says, look, you saved 0.12 megs. Megs, okay, so um, you have to move the decimal over for kilobytes. So let's close this. I'm going to go back and I'm going to save it just to make sure. And let me close. And here, okay, sure enough. This is, if you can see, this is the current size, 4,516. And here's what it was before, 4,636. Now keep in mind, we had only seven slides. We had what, one? one or two pictures, we had one video, we had one audio. If you had a longer PowerPoint presentation, and they frequently are, that compression could have saved you a lot more space, and, and it would be well worth it. So a good thing to know. That takes us through step 32. That means step 33 is to close everything I mean, I'm, I'm just closing everything, and we're going to submit it. Once again, I would emphasize to you that some students, depending on if we have completed the embedding of My Lab IT into PAUSE, some students will go to PAUSE and use the submission links in PAUSE. Some students will still need to go to this second website, the, the MyITLab.com website. I'm going to bring that up so that I can submit, and I'll restart the video when I'm ready. I'm ready to submit. I'm going to choose my file. Now again, this is going to be a larger file than what you're used to, so be patient. Don't forget, this is my PowerPoint One folder. Is it your PowerPoint One folder? Make sure you're navigating to the correct folder, PowerPoint Two, and double check, and you can see I'm going to make this a little bigger. This should be the Chapter Two file. Most common mistake is to upload the wrong file. You get like one point and you're in shock that you didn't get more points than that. And it's because you submitted the wrong file. So pick the correct file, open. Now upload, be patient, and wait for that success. Not quite as quick as the past ones, is it? I mean, you got to wait, wait until it says success. Even if it says 100%, wait for success. Wait for that success. It's not done. There it is. Now it's ready to submit. Submit for grading. Now I have found when it finishes grading, it closes this. <gasps> I said when it's finished grading. And it says pending. <laughs> it's still very quick. It just can never be fast enough, can it? Okay, I'm going to click on these three dots, and I'm going to click View Submission. Oh, I'm nervous. Nope, oh, I had to scroll up. Oh, I had to scroll up. There it is. Excellent. 100%, folks. 100%. So we have all of our steps correct throughout that. And remember that you can always look at the scorecard if you've made a little mistake. And you, know, you saw there were a couple times that I could have easily made a mistake. I just happened to catch it before I continued on to the next step. Um, and, and it's really because I'm using a checklist. I'm trying very hard not to miss any of these steps. So I hope this helped. Thank you so much, folks. As always, I appreciate you. And I do hope that you're having fun. Stick with it. And we'll see you for the next assignment.